In this video, we're reviewing Blue Beetle and showing you how to unlock an ancient world-melding power through a cocktail I've named the Scarab, today on The Martini Shot. Hello and welcome to The Martini Shot, home of movie reviews and movie-themed cocktails. My name is Brandon. Before we get into the review, let's honor both the Mexican and Egyptian backgrounds of our titular character in one great cocktail named the Scarab. And hey, if you enjoy movie reviews and movie-themed cocktails, be sure to leave a like and hit the subscribe button if you'd like to help support the channel. The Scarab is a otherworldly device that forms a symbiotic bond with a host of its choosing, giving them incredible abilities. The host in this film is Jaime Reyes, and for this drink, I wanted to focus on some flavors that draw from both Reyes' Mexican heritage and the Egyptian inspiration for the Scarab itself. This is a margarita-style cocktail that employs mezcal, lime juice, and blue curacao for familiar flavors, but also employs mint and an anise-flavored liqueur called Arak to give this drink a super interesting flavor profile. Let's go ahead and get into it. But before we get started with the cocktail itself, we need to go ahead and prep our glass. You can use a rocks glass for this, and for the rim, we are gonna be adding some black sugar. And you would rim this glass the same way you would do any other glass. You just take something like a lime or a lemon wedge, run it around the rim, and then coat the rim with the sugar. I'm only gonna be doing a half rim for this one, just so you can kind of have your choice if you wanna have a sip with the sugar or without the sugar. This makes it a lot more easy. Go ahead and grab a shaker and a few leaves of fresh mint. You're gonna be adding about five to six mint leaves to your shaker, or maybe a little bit more if your leaves happen to be a little bit on the smaller side. And now we're gonna go ahead and muddle those mint leaves, and that's really going to express the oil out of the leaves and make that mint taste and smell a lot more apparent. Next up, we are gonna be adding some blueberry syrup, specifically Rose's blueberry syrup. I went with this one just because normal blueberry syrup, if you were to make it at home, comes out a lot more purple, and I was looking for something a little bit more on the blue side to kind of go along with the rest of the cocktail's color. So if you can get your hands on this, definitely use this one. You can use a normal blueberry syrup. You'll still kind of get the same flavor palette. It might just look a little bit different than my final product. And for the blueberry syrup, you're gonna be doing one whole ounce. Next up is some fresh squeezed lime juice. You're gonna be doing a 3 fourths ounce. All right, now we can get into our alcoholic ingredients. First, starting with our blue curacao. This is going to be taking the place of our orange liqueur that you would typically find in a margarita. And you're gonna be adding half an ounce. Next is the most interesting ingredient in the lineup, and that is a rock. This is a anise-based liqueur. Its flavor is very licorice-leaning, very similar to maybe like an absinthe. I know this is a little bit of an out-there ingredient, so you might not be able to get your hands on it. In that case, if you get your hands on some absinthe, you can either do an absinthe rinse in the glass before you pour it in there, or you can do a very small spritz of absinthe right on top of the cocktail once it's in the glass. But for the Arak, we're gonna go ahead and add half an ounce. And then for our base beer, we're gonna be using Mezcal. You're gonna be doing one and a half ounces. All right, let's grab some ice and go ahead and shake the chill. Now you can go ahead and throw some ice into your prepared glass. And then we're gonna double strain the cocktail to make sure any bits of mint leaves stay out of the final product. And there you go, now we have the Scarab. So the first thing that you'll notice that'll be very different from a normal margarita is the scent of licorice on the nose whenever you kind of go in for a sip. That's that rock coming through and it's very, very apparent, but it's going to be melding very, very well with the rest of the ingredients we have in here. So the first thing you'll taste up front is the smokiness of the mezcal and that tartness of the lime. Very, very akin to a mezcal margarita when you're first going in. But then on the back end, there's this really interesting cooling kind of taste that comes with the combination of the mint and the Arak. The mint is nice and crisp, and you get just the faintest little bit of that licorice taste from the Arak. It's not overpowering, so if you're not a fan of licorice or the anise flavors at all, I don't think you're really gonna have much of an issue with this. And then you even have a little bit of that sweetness from the blueberry kind of just lingering on your tongue afterwards. I think this is a fantastic spin on a normal margarita that goes a little bit out there, but Everything just kind of works in harmony very, very well. I love the progression of this where it goes from a normal mezcal margarita to something a little bit different. And you can pick up on little tiny notes each time you go in for a sip. It's very, very nice. Very, very fun cocktail. Looks great as well. If you can't get your hands on a rack, I would definitely try experimenting with absinthe just to try to see if you can get something a little bit close to what I've made here. But yeah, if this happens to be in your wheelhouse, definitely check it out. Very, very interesting cocktail. Now that we have our drink, let's fly straight into the review of Blue Beetle. 
Here's a scenario for you. You go to an amusement park and ride a roller coaster. You think, yeah, that's, that's pretty fun. Then you go to the next ride, and it's almost the same ride. Sure, it looks a bit different and may have a slightly different style to it, but it still goes through the same loops and bends as the previous ride. But that's okay, the first one was fun, so by definition this one is fun too. But then as you keep going on more rides, you start to find them all to be so similar to one another to the point you don't feel as thrilled as you did the first time, and now you're kind of just left with a headache. That's essentially how I feel about comic book movies right now. DC is in the midst of a total rehaul of its cinematic universe, being led up by James Gunn, who hopes to create somewhat of a consistent world for some of the best comic characters ever made. The Flash was supposed to be the final sprint for the original DCEU, but now their latest film, Blue Beetle, is kind of in a weird spot. It's been touted as the first film of the new DCEU, but it was made before Gunn stepped in to control the direction of the overarching universe. So it doesn't really reflect what the future may hold for the brand, and honestly, that's probably not a bad thing. Blue Beetle is at its best when it gives time for the main cast to interact and bounce off of one another, leading to some fairly comedic and emotional moments that feel genuine to the family dynamic, as well as the Mexican-American experience. Unfortunately, none of these elements really lend themselves to anything all that interesting. It's fairly standard origin movie fare that is hardly compelling in its conflict, writing, world building, or antagonists. It's a bit of a success for representation, but it feels so run of the mill it's hard to believe that this is blazing a trail in any aspect. A young man named Jaime Reyes accidentally comes into possession of an alien weapon called the Scarab, which forms a symbiotic relationship with its host, granting them a protective exoskeleton outfitted with any kind of weapons you can imagine. This puts him and his family into the sights of the Shady Cord Industries, who hope to reclaim the Scarab in order to power a high-tech army to assist in keeping their firm grasp on the world. For me, the strongest aspect of the film was the main cast, as I found a lot of their interactions to feel very genuine and fun. Zolo Meriduen as Jaime is filled with a humbleness and positive energy that makes him likable enough to care about, even if his own personal story isn't all that interesting or engaging. He's a fun time, but truth be told, he doesn't have a ton going for him to allow him to stand out among the pack of other teen heroes. His family dynamic at least helps to keep the character grounded, with each member of the family making somewhat of an impact on his decisions and choices. Damien Alcazar as Jaime's father Alberto, and Belissa Escobedo as his sister Milagro are some of the standouts. Though George Lopez's paranoid conspiracy theorist Uncle Rudy often steals the scenes he's in through what I can only assume is a lot of improv. The Reyes family feels like an authentic amalgamation of the Hispanic family dynamic, whose more emotional moments tended to resonate with me fairly well, even if they're a bit cliched at times. Speaking of cliche, the romance angle for Jaime here feels super forced and pretty devoid of chemistry. The villain department is unfortunately sorely lacking due in part to a mixture of underdeveloped writing and aimless performances. Susan Sarandon's Victoria Cord represents a personification of greed and industrial imperialism as her company looks to gentrify its surroundings and militarize its operations to keep the less fortunate from opposing her. This kind of just leads to a run-of-the-mill evil businesswoman archetype that ends up being far from memorable. Sarandon's a great actress, but the performance feels incredibly one-note and very sleepwalkish at times but I do think this comes from the material she's given. Raul Trujillo's Carapac serves as Victoria's muscle, who more often than not is simply a vehicle for fight scenes rather than an interesting character. The film does try to give him some depth by the end through a very rushed montage, but there's no real satisfying payoff to this as he spends the majority of the film as a pretty stereotypical archetype. The man of few words, who comes to match the hero in abilities and weapons, who constantly repeats that the hero is weak, because he has a family and friends. It's really just lazy writing and conflict, which is a pretty significant issue I have with this film. The film sets itself up to have a lot of themes that could have been spun into an interesting narrative, like gentrification, corporate overreach, or the over-militarization of police, but these are all made as light and forgettable as possible in order to make the film more approachable. This unfortunately does little to give the film an impact or its own identity. It predictably moves through its reluctant hero story as blandly as possible with very little personality shining through. The writing doesn't exactly allow Blue Beetle to be as youthfully charismatic as Spider-Man, nor does it build a fun dynamic between host and symbiote akin to Venom. Can't believe this film just made me compliment Venom. Basically what I'm getting at is that the film is derivative of other superhero films, but can't really outdo some of the elements it's sharing with those films. It's great that we finally have a Latino-led superhero film from one of the big studios, but surely we could have tried to accomplish more than just the easy part. 
The writing also does a disservice to building upon the Blue Beetle mythos. While it's not a bad thing to leave us in the dark on the exact origins of the Scarab, it still feels like we're hung a little dry on understanding it better. The Scarab is said to be sentient and even have a name, but we don't exactly get any kind of character out of it aside from bland, stereotypical, monotone AI. It's said that the Scarab has to choose a worthy host to unlock its powers, but I don't think we ever really get a great sense of what makes Jaime the optimal host. It's not like he's the first person to interact with it, as the film explains the origins of another Blue Beetle who was studying the Scarab, but couldn't access its power. But then the beginning of the film makes it seem like the Scarab was only just now being physically discovered? I don't know. Something else I noticed was how much the film pushes that Jaime shouldn't kill people, but then his family seems to just straight up murder people later on in the film. I just thought that was funny. Everything just feels really half-baked at times, not being thoroughly thought out and coasting off of the film's charm which isn't exactly strong enough to let me be a little bit more forgiving. I will give the film points for a practical costume, while occasionally smothered in CGI does have some semblance of presence. In motion, it looks pretty good, managing to give an expressionless face a decent amount of personality, akin to how the Deadpool films tackled the same issue. Shame the same can't really be said about the villain who just ends up looking like one of the Jaegers from Pacific Rim. The rest of the special effects can be a bit of a mixed bag, with some of the positives coming from the Blue Beetle tech in action, the film's color grading and palette, and the film setting of Palmera City. We do get the expected poorly lit green screens from time to time, but honestly, I didn't find them to be nearly as bad as other superhero films from the past few years. There is one scene taking place inside a character's head, though, that is so hazy and filled with lens flares that I thought I was in J.J. Abrams' wet dream. The music is mostly forgettable, occasionally leaning on some underwhelming licensed song choices that just feel out of place. That's unfortunately my takeaway at the end of the day, the film is just forgettable as hell. Occasionally endearing family dynamics aside, Blue Beetle's joy and excitement is only really impactful if you're not worn out from the constant onslaught from a genre struggling to reinvent itself, or this is your first superhero movie. While not as much of a technical or narrative misfire as some of its contemporaries, it's easy to see the old framework under its new coat of paint. There's elements briefly touched upon that could have led to something truly fundamentally different for both DC and the genre as a whole, but the film is too content with settling into the status quo to be the breath of fresh air DC desperately needs. At the end of the day, it's not appalling to look at or grading to sit through, so that at least makes it better than Black Adam. For my rating, I'm giving this film two and a half Big Belly Burger boxes out of five. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of The Martini Shot. If you saw Blue Beetle, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it down in the comments. And if you like what you saw here and would like to see more, don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow me across all social media channels. Those links are down in the description below. And if you enjoy movie reviews and movie-themed cocktails, be sure to check out my website, martinishot.blog. Until next time, thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Live deliciously, but please remember, drink responsibly.